Jim Coleman has been in the tower business for a long time, has put up untold number of towers and taken down probably untold number of towers, put in a lot of FMs and AMs. He's working with, <laughs> he works with AT&T and he is the national, get this, the national tower safety manager. Boy, that, but Jim's got a lot of information he wants to share about towers. I asked him if he would talk about aware of, because once that tower is put up and back when he was putting towers up, once he finished putting them up and left, that's yours now. <laughs> you sort of got to look after it, and there's a lot of things you need to do. And you have to remember that the antenna, whether it's an AM or an FM or a television, the antenna is the last place that you as an engineer has any kind of control over what's going out to the listeners or the viewers. So uh, all the work that's done in the studio, all the nice work you do in the transmitter building, if it doesn't get up that tower that Jim or somebody like Jim or, or John does, uh, if it doesn't get up there and get off of that piece of metal stuck up on the top, all is, all is lost. So it's very important, and I, I've always learned, and I learned a lot from, from Jim when he put our <laughs> tower up, it's really important that you as an engineer pay attention uh, to the tower. Don't just say, well, <laughs> yeah, there it is, still standing, so I guess everything is okay. But if you don't pay attention to some things, it may not be standing the next time you go. So uh, Jim Coleman with uh, National Sales, or National, not Sales, uh, Tower Safety Manager. The floor is yours. Thank you, Larry. So I uh, look out over the group here. Um, I know most of you. Uh, I've worked for most of you. Uh, it's wonderful to see you all today. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to come and... Did you turn on your wireless? I did. did. I did, yeah. Um, to come and talk to you today. Yeah, nifty new title, huh? So I'd love to take credit for this, uh, just because I think it looks really neat. Um, but wireless estimator, Craig Lacutus, is kind enough to have allowed me to share this with you all. Um, nice, huh? Does this look like your tower? If, mechanical beam tilt? Yeah, mechanical beam tilt, exactly right, yeah. No, uh, it looks like maybe you may have hired the wrong tower crew. Maybe, right? I don't see any broken guy wires or anything, so it means that someone wanted to do a plumb intention on it but didn't know what the heck they were doing. That'd be my guess, right? Okay, well, let's see if we can figure out what it is that would help us make that not happen. Oh, wow, a lot of numbers. OSHA standards, right? That's the Department of Labor, Occupational Safety and Health, right? What does that have to do with tower safety? Isn't that your question now? I'm supposed to be talking about tower and safety and all that maintenance, right? Well, these are the guys that actually 29 CFR 1910 maintenance, 29 CFR 1926 construction. You're going to get to work with both of those like every time when you're working in the studios, when you're working at the tower site, one of those two is going to be on you every single time, all right? The CFR stands for Code of Federal Regulations. Okay, the law, the law, right? CPL, multi-employer worksite. That's the part we want to really get to here kind of quickly, right? It's a policy statement by the government. All that junk down at the bottom there, that's where you come in. So multi-employer worksite policy multi-employer work sites, you're a creating employer, an exposing employer, a correcting employer, a controlling employer, or maybe you're all of the above. So you hire John to come and do work on your structure, right? You're a controlling contractor. John is a controlling contractor, right? John's creating hazards. All right, so he has to worry about hazard abatement. All right, 
Why are you a controlling contractor? It's the government talking, not me, okay? You own the site. You own the site. All right? Does that mean you're a controlling contractor? We're both <laughs> kind of. AT&T might own a site, and we might assign the responsibilities of uh, watching over and controlling that to a contractor like SBA or American Tower or Crown Castle or entity we might call um, vertical realtor, right? Would AT&T have control? Get sued in the lawsuit. But we're, I, but we're, <laughs> I get to sit across from that a lot, you know, believe me, it's not nearly as much fun as it sounds like. But you are a controlling contractor, but the reason that you're a controlling contractor, let's say uh, it's Jeff's site and Mobile, and it's on the TV tower where I got to work. Jeff doesn't own the tower, but he's a controlling contractor, right? Because I'm there under contract working for Jeff. And so if Jeff stops paying me, right, I stop work. If I stop work, I abated the hazard. All the hazards went away. And therefore, you're a controlling contractor, right? Now, Jeff is on the site. There's a TV station that owns the site. For me to get on the site, the TV contractor had to give me permission to go and get on the tower, right? And I had to jump through all kinds of hoops for him to let me do that. The tower owner is a controlling contractor, okay? AT&T uses a contractor maintenance matrix. We were talking about that earlier. And the matrix says we hire a really large contractor. And that's because we don't want to manage thousands of contractors. We'd like to only manage two dozen contractors, right? It's a whole lot. It's easier to manage that. And as a result of that, those contractors, which we call turf vendors, may subcontract work to John to go and do, right? The turf vendor is a controlling contractor. John is a controlling contractor. AT&T is a controlling contractor. The guy that's managing the tower is a controlling contractor. All of us now, as controlling contractors, we got to know what the heck's going on here, okay? By the way, you hired him and so you just walked away, right? You good? It, it won't matter. It'll be the Department of Labor. <laughs> you won't even have to get to an attorney yet, okay? You hired him because you knew there was a hazard, right? You're knowledgeable of the hazard. We were talking about a little while ago. Uh, one, uh, I've forgotten who it was now, was talking to me, and he was upset because crew came onto his site. It's an FM site, Carrollton, Alabama. He said, that's what, what, 1,000 feet, 800 and something? Yeah, 1,200. And uh, AT&T has a site there, and it's at like 350. And the guy says, well, you're going to have to turn your FM off. Right? Maybe you got the wrong contractor there is what I told him. Right? Is there an RF hazard there? No, no RF hazard. In fact, it's going to be hard to listen to the radio station that he's sending out because I'm in the umbrella of it and it's just right over my, I can't, you know, right? Nothing happened in there, no RF there. So maybe the skill of the employees that were on site wasn't good. To his point, AT&T sent a crew. AT&T sent it even though a turf contractor hired a subcontractor it's still, he, he's still there representing AT&T, right? Nod your head like this. Yeah, he's representing AT&T, right? That's the reason every time I hear the news and something, you know, untoward goes on, whatever it is, then it's AT&T's fault. John's company, I don't hear about him at all. He was the one on site. It was his personnel, but I, I don't hear about John. By the way, if his employee got hurt, just for all of you all to know, Workman's comp would cover his employee. That, of course, is if y'all made sure 
that the contractor you hired that's working on your tower has workman's compensation insurance. All right? All those were OSHA standards, right? Code of Federal Regulations. You know about those. I've explained to you now some of the reasons you should be interested about them, right? A few more consensus standards. ANSI is a consensus body. American National Standards Institute. It's a consensus body. Who's that? That's all of us. That's everybody that's not the government. And so all of us, broadcast engineers, we all get together and we sit down and we invite anyone else who wants to come in and uh, we sit down and we decide we're going to write some rules on RF or, or whatever we're going to write them on, right? And we get together and work on that and the idea there is that all of us are smarter than one of us. And the more of us we get together, the smarter we are, right? And that's how consensus standards get written. So, Consensus standards in particular that you should be really, really, really interested in is the newest one, the ANSI A1048. That's a really nice standard because that one is the first standard ever written for telecommunications, construction and maintenance work and demolition ever, ever, all right? So before, <laughs> when Larry would call me and he'd say, I need this fixed, and I'd go down there and I, he told me many times I scared him to death. I was just kind of riding by the seat of my pants. That's like 50 years ago, right? There weren't any, there's no guidance. No specific rules. It was passed on by word of mouth from one who knew to someone else who wanted to know. That's no longer the case. A1048. Okay? If the company you hire doesn't know what A1048 is, that's a bad day for you. It's not good. It's an easy question for you to ask, right? Good. ANSI TIA322. Those first two consensus. The A1048 is talking to John and his crew and the members of his crew and all of the rest of us who are physically doing the work, okay? And that's important because in that, it's telling us how we're going to go about properly rigging your tower. That's a big deal, okay? Whether I'm stacking it, whether I'm putting it up or taking it down or I'm putting something on it or taking something off of it, that's the most dangerous time for your tower. It's not in a bad storm. Most storms don't bring down towers. They just don't fall down by storms because we built them so they wouldn't fall down in storms, right? That, that's the whole deal. So when do they fall down? Most often they are damaged during either construction, maintenance, or disassembly. Or I'm putting something else on it, right? A new antenna. 322 is a structural standard. It's a TIA standard, Telecommunication Industry Association. You're familiar with that, but you're familiar with the TIA 222, right? That's the one, all of y'all who own a tower, you're familiar with that one because the guy comes up and he says, well, I wanna change or put a new antenna on that tower, and oh, by the way, it doesn't meet the standard. And you gotta do this structural reinforcement and spend hundreds of dollars. Hundreds of dollars? <laughs> it's a lot more than hundred dollars, isn't it? Right? And if I'm really lucky, you know, I kind of like that, you know, you... I, so you know, every time you put something on a tower, or take something off of the tower, doesn't mean that you have to have a structural evaluation done of the tower, no matter what any engineer tells you, okay? It's required if you're gonna put something that the engineer of record, the guy that was the engineer stamp seal on the drawing that you're holding in your hand that says 222C or D, right? You've had the tower a long time. 
And as long as I only replace an antenna, right, or put one on that I had never put on before, but he said I could put it on, right, with a certain size piece of transmission line, I'm cool. I'm good. Nobody is going to bother you. Nobody's going to say a word to you. But let's say it's a television tower and we have this DTV something another thing that takes place and it says I got to take this antenna off the top of the tower and I got to put another antenna on the top. Not the same antenna, right? Might be shorter, weighs less, right? Doesn't matter. The engineer of record said I could have this 12 bay bat wing antenna, 130 feet tall, low channel, right? And I'm putting up this much higher frequency antenna that's half that size. Doesn't matter. Got to have a structural done on the tower for that antenna. It's a good time to have him evaluate whatever else you think you might sort of want to, could, maybe want to do <coughs> later, right? Because if he puts it on there now and evaluates it now, you won't have to do it again, right? Good news? Could be good news. So how does 322 and 1848 work and why is that important to you? Because under those two consensus standards and under the guidance that occupational safety and health has, so how does occupational safety and health get into this? They use the general duty clause on you guys, okay? If we didn't write it down and we don't know about it, and some consensus standard says this is a better way to do it, right? And it's been documented and all of us set, signed off on it and Nancy said it was a good thing, right? OSHA will cite you because of that consensus standard and they will do it under the general duty clause. You should have known. Y'all are all engineers. You should have known that that was a problem, right? And that's how they get you, all right? So if you'll get an OSHA, OSHA citation. So 322 and 1848. The 1848 is John says, I'm going to bring my hoist out here. I'm going to use this size line, this size block, and I'm going to attach it up here at this location. I'm going to attach a uh, heel block down here, and I'm going to put the hoist over there, and I'm going to tag this certain way. And he submits a rigging plan. Okay? There are four classes of rigging plans. The first one, Crown Castle says you got to submit a rigging plan. The standard doesn't require it, okay? It says you're going to rig directly to the structure. You're going to pick up something that weighs less than 350 pounds. Crown says we don't care. You're rigging on our tower. We want a rigging plan. And oh, by the way, you got to submit it 48 hours before you get to the site to go and do work, Crown says. So if you get there, and you don't have that, and they hadn't received that, you don't get to go to work. Now that becomes a problem for y'all. Why? Maybe you're off the air. Right? Right? So how are you going to accommodate that? Well, if I was to make a suggestion, I would suggest that you get an approved rigging plan to Crown Castle or American Tower or SBA, they all require it, right? Before you need it, all right? And then you're going to hire a crew to come and do work, right? Let's talk about how those two standards work together. We talked about what John's part is. He's got to do A1048. He's got to create a rigging plan. He's got to tell him what he's going to do because he's the only one who really knows how he's going to pick it up and what toys and tools he's got to do it with, right? Because as all of y'all have seen, if I arrive on site, I got certain stuff. Somebody else arrives on site, they got certain stuff, right? If, if the two of you show up, two of you show up on different sites, you're coming to help somebody, you got stuff in your truck, maybe that Jeff doesn't have in his truck, right? That's the reason you came, helping the guy out. So I can't create a rigging plan for John because I don't know what John has. 322, that's an engineering standard, like I said, and the engineering part of it is that if, oh, uh, it's tricky here now. Tells you there was four classes of rigging plan, right? 
the class four rigging plan is anytime I'm going to put a gin pole on a tower, anytime. It's a class four rigging plan. All right. Well, I mean that's not so bad. So when I'm not using a pole, I don't have I don't have to do that. And not exactly. Okay, not exactly. If I rig to an appurtenance, do we know what an appurtenance is? How many people know what an appurtenance is? You don't count. What's an appurtenance? This is good stuff. Anything that is attached to the structure that if I took it off, the tower won't fall down, that's an appurtenance. Anything I can unbolt from it, take it off, put it on the ground, doesn't care, right? Doesn't care. That's an appurtenance, right? If I rig to an appurtenance, so all these cell guys out here doing work? For AT&T, maybe, right? And you see them take, and they have a piece of rope, they're going to lift an antenna. Let's say that the antenna is going to weigh, pick a number, 250, 250 pounds? Yeah, I mean, something like that. Less than 350 pounds. So it should be a class one rigging plan, right? No, because I rigged to an appurtenance. As soon as I rig to an appurtenance, it's a class four rigging plan. Doesn't matter what the weight is I pick up, okay? Just bolt it onto the tower now, that's all, right? The engineer of record for, for a class four rigging plan, I have to have a competent rigger on site. That might be John. That might be the gentleman sitting next to you that I don't know yet that works for John. My son. Hi. My son, Corey your, your, and your name is? Corey. 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 So Corey could be the competent rigger on site. John could be the qualified rigger, right? The one that created the rigging plan. And then there's going to be a qualified engineer. Probably doesn't work for John, right? That one with the stamp in his hand, that's right. And then I'm going to have a class four rigging plan. That's important for you because when the guy says, oh, by the way, X number of dollars is what it's costing, you now know why part of the X number of dollars is costing, right? I mean, makes good sense. That engineer, right? On the other hand, if you ask John as a part of his doing work to furnish you a copy of his rigging plan, whatever. So he charged you money for the engineer of record to stamp and seal the drawings on his rigging plan, right? Why wouldn't you want a copy of the rigging plan? I, I don't know. AT&T collects all of them, right? And if you had that, right, could you use that to do that maintenance work with an approved rigging plan? Nod your head like this, all right? Yes, you could, all right? Stamp sealed, everything is cool. You hire John to come back and say, John, are you gonna rig the same way? Yep, okay, we're good. That was nice, why? That worked good, right? John likes it too because you call John back. Okay? anyone could use that rigging plan. The only requirement is, of course, that the equipment that John listed in his rigging plan be the equipment you're gonna use. Good so far? That's how all that works together, okay? 222 is the engineer, 1848 is John and Corey, right? And you're the customer. So there's a couple of things that John should be providing you every single time he comes to your site. One is he's, that he has to do a hazard assessment. And this involves you because when he arrives there, if John's a smart man, he certainly appears to be, he says, what are the hazards on your site? Because you should know that, right? Right? You do maintenance, right? Then you know what the hazards are, right? They're in your log, in the book, in the, you know, when you got there, you walked around the base of the tower and, you know, it looked like somebody had spread nuts and bolts out and, you know, 55 guy on the drums, they're just everywhere. That might be a hazard. 
Could be a hazard, right? Because when I leave the sites, there's nothing laying on the ground when I leave. Nothing. I'll bet John doesn't leave anything laying on the site. If you want him to leave something behind, you've got to tell him you want him to leave it behind. Pile it right over there. Like that. And the reason we do that is if it's laying on the ground when I get there the next time, it fell out of the sky, and I have a place to start looking. Okay? You should do the same thing. Every time you go, don't just walk into the building. Don't just walk into the building. Walk around and see if your ground bars are still there. Right? Make sure nobody's camped out by the hot air vent by on the back of your transmitter site. Right? That's part of your job. You've got to do that. Okay? Two twenty two G. I use G instead of H so that we kind of get some understandings. I've done a little bit of discussion on how uh, states and municipalities, they're, the governing bodies, they're deciding what the standard is that your structure has to fall under. And we already talked about as long as what the stamped engineered seal said on the drawing, as long as you keep all of that, you don't have to have a new one. And I'm going to use an example here that will help you remember because I had a, another really smart engineer tell me this and I thought it was a wonderful thing. I own a warehouse, and the warehouse was built in the 40s. And at that junction in time, the warehouse didn't require any fire suppression inside it at all, zero, okay? And as long as I keep it a warehouse, I don't ever have to put fire suppression in it ever, ever. But. If I die, decide to make it uh, multi-tenant dwellings inside this warehouse and I separate it into apartments, right? Whatever the code is in that city on that day that I get the building permit, that's what it's got to be. The tower is the same way. It's the same way, okay? Works exactly the same. For you to know which standard it has to be upheld to, you have to go to the city or municipality and ask them what it is because every single city could have a different one that they have decided they're going to accept okay every single one so mobile might be one way birmingham might be another Mon montgomery yet an again another one. and i can't help you any more than that you just have to keep track of it it'll be important to you if the guy comes to you as was mentioned earlier and says well you got to make it meet the latest one now, sometimes it's not the requirement of the standard. So you're renting from a vertical realtor, right? And that vertical realtor, you, you want to change out your antenna. You're, put, you're changing it from one brand of antenna to another one. You're buying a nice new Shively antenna. It's really shiny. It looks really good, right? And you're taking down an ERI or some other antenna. And when that happens, different antenna now, right? Still 12 bays long, still cycloidal in nature. It's not a panel. What the heck? What's the difference? It's a different antenna. And at that junction in time, there is a really good possibility that the owner of the structure is going to say, we're going to have to do a structural evaluation of that tower. And there's even a better chance that what will happen is G has just recently been superseded by H. And he's going to say, we got to make that sucker meet H. And he's going to make you pay to do it. Okay? Warning. There's nothing you're going to be able to do to get out of that. He really is going to have to have a structural done on it. <laughs> there is a possibility that there will be some structural improvement that's needed. And John may be, I don't know John, I just met him today. And John may be really, really, really good at putting antennas and lines on towers. But John may not be really, really good at doing structural modifications on towers. I, I don't know. That first picture I showed you, right? All right? He may have been really good at changing lights, 
but he was not very good at doing plum and tension. So what you have to do is make a determination of whether John has that skill. Okay? Wasn't meant to pick on you, John. All right. <laughs> they look like this when you get them all printed out. And I didn't print them out everywhere, but you know, you're going to get this. And so to help you with all this stuff, I've been it's just it's just been rolling out of my mouth like big time, right? Y'all have been taking notes, I can tell, because I've seen all the writing going on. Not really. So the National Association of Tower Erectors, I'm pretty familiar with them as well. They put together three checklists. And that's where they're located. They're free to you. They cost nothing. All that you have to do is just go and download them. And they're in PDF formats, okay? And so one of them is the Tower Owner Safety Guidelines. It's a really nice little checklist to go through, right? Help you know what you, you can add to it. It's the minimum, right? Qualified Contractor what questions you might want to ask John, right? I think that this is a reminder to make sure you ask those questions, right? Not that you aren't, haven't got other good questions you may need to ask, right? Broadcaster's checklist, right? Y'all specifically, right? They're all free. All you got to do is just go download them. I'd have a couple of copies around. Sometimes it's, uh, you know, hey, John, fill this out. Hey, Corey, fill this out, right? Right? The safety guidelines. Why do we want to know that stuff? Why do we want to know that stuff? Come on. It is in color, yeah. <coughs> Duct tape's good for everything. This is actually Pensacola, Florida. Believe it or not, I actually built the tower. This work is not a part of my work. We did go and make repairs to the work, right? The installation was perfect. But no maintenance was done on the structure. Yeah. So this is a piece of rigid transmission line on the outside of this tower, right? And uh, you know those brass spring hangers with the collar that goes around and the spring underneath it and all that kind of crap? Not needed. Not, yeah, that stuff's crap. I, you know, I don't know why anybody has that stuff around. I mean, you gotta maintain that stuff, take care of it all, right? Jeff, has, have you ever noticed any spring hanger issues on any sites you've ever had? One in particular, I, I, he and I worked together on a site and uh, I don't know, hundreds of springs failed. Hundreds of springs failed. Hundreds. Now, I, and it was nice, I mean, they replaced all the springs. Oh, did you? They replaced the first one. The first one. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I misspoke there. I did, you know. All right? But the springs all failed. So let's just talk about hangers and different kinds of hangers just a moment here. All right, just a moment. If it's a flexible piece of line, they call them hangers, and that's a lie, okay? They don't hang anything. All they do is guide the transmission line from wherever it is to wherever it's going. That's all. They don't hold anything up. They don't hang anything up, all right? If the guy doesn't install the hoisting grips, they cannot be any further than 200 feet apart. They cannot be, doesn't matter who the manufacturer of the line is, on semi-flexible line, it has to be a hoisting grip at least every 200 feet, right? And by the way, that's what's doing all the holding up. So if they tie that to a ladder rung or a diagonal, <coughs> when it slides down, not if, all right? When it slides down, 
It will not, when, when it gets cold again and wants to pick it back up, right? It, what it'll do is just bend whatever it's attached to, okay? And then over a little bit of time, eventually, it's just going to start pulling the legs together if it got tied to a diagonal or whatever, and then you got a really big issue, all right? And that's really what happens, okay? That's semi-flexible line. 200 feet apart, doesn't matter what the diameter of the line is, right? And they're not really hangers, they're guides. The line does go up and down with heating and cooling. That nice black line absorbs lots of heat, okay? Rigid transmission line. It's interesting because in the cellular market, if it's a piece of inch and five-eighths, semi-flexible line, coaxial cable, right, they want to call that hard line. You know why they call it hard line? This is really crazy. Because it's hard to bend. <laughs> okay? There's nothing hard about that. You know, if you put it across your knee, it bends pretty good. It's, it's not very trouble. It's not a big deal, right? Rigid line, on the other hand, it's just a piece of copper water pipe, right? And the only thing keeping it in the air, if you've ever watched any of us put rigid line in, we put a rigid fixed hanger at the bottom of the tower. And then we start stacking pieces of line on top of it, and we install those spring hanger things, right? And what should the tension, if you don't know what the tension of the spring hanger should be, how could you find that out? This is a trick. You'll know whether the guy knows what he's doing or not, right? How many spring hangers are required on a 20-foot section of transmission line? How many springs are required on any size of rigid transmission line that is 20 feet long or 17 feet long? Two. Okay? So the entire weight of that piece, section of transmission line is held by two springs, or a ribbon hanger, or whatever the design is, right? Two of them. So if you take a piece of rigid line, and you put it up on a tower, and you, take, and you hold the piece of copper, and you just let the spring stay recoiled, all of it, and you tie that to the rigid transmission line, and you let the piece of rigid transmission line go, right? It's going to expand, right? That's how long they all need to be. Oh, it's easy. Now, another easy way would be to read the piece of paper that came with the transmission line, right? If you were smart, you'd collect a couple of those pieces of paper and put them in a filing cabinet so the next guy comes along and asks you that question, you can give him that information. Because the manufacturers, they do change springs and all of that kind of stuff over time, and you want to know what it is because there are going to be some that break as Jeff has indicated, okay? That's rigid transmission line. I didn't put the tape on here. I got a call because a lighting contractor told the individual owner of this tower that it was an unsafe tower. He says it's an unsafe tower. It's a lighting contractor. He doesn't know how to fix that. It's unsafe to him, right? It's unsafe for him to work on it because he doesn't have the skills, knowledge, or expertise to do that work, right? It's not an unsafe tower for me. I go down there, I fix it, right? It is your tower. That's exactly true. It is. Yeah. 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 Okay. I'm using red duct tape now. Oh, red duct tape now. Oh, wait, it's clearly marked. Everybody could see it from the ground, right? Okay. Camouflage grill tape, nobody can see it. We were their hangers and just fell off. I have before. Yeah, that's before he had it. Before he had it. All right, so qualified contractors checklist. Again, uh, it's a tool that will assist you, right? Because you're not going to remember everything I say. I, I'm pretty sure of that. And, and the uh, ins basic broadcast tower inspection checklist, 
Um, checklists are really, really good items because as the previous speaker uh, gave guidance to us all, you know, we walk by and we see it a million times and, and we just don't see it anymore. We may have saw it, seen it the first time and we said, you know, I'm going to get to fix that. I'll, I'll remember to fix that, right? And then six more times and after that I don't even see it anymore, right? And so the checklist helps, us, helps me, helps all of us ensure that we look at everything. And so please use these as bottom line, basic, you know, and if, if you have a site that has a, an issue that comes up repeatedly, add that to the list. That way, you will remember to go and look at it. Because I don't know about you, but I'm old and I don't remember everything very well at all. Types of inspections, because Larry said I had to talk about inspections. These are the different kinds of inspections, right? Y'all all know about all those different kinds? All right? Do you know how often you are required to inspect your structure? What kind of structure? Good question. <laughs> so, I have a good answer. I have a good answer. Well, yeah. Three years and five years. And it comes from the TIA. All right. It comes from 222. And it talks about periodic inspections. And so within that standard, they haven't changed it, even the new revision. It's every three and five years. Three years on self-supporting type structures. So monopoles and self-supporters. Every, no, flip that. Monopoles and self-supporters are every five years. And guide towers are every three years. Okay? Told you I don't remember everything all the time. All right, so your guide tower every three years. Is that how often you inspect them? Is there um, a particular height that this rules kick in? No. 100 foot tower? 100 foot tower. Huh. Still the same thing. Doesn't matter. It's just by type. All right? So how often do you generally inspect them? I'm going to make a wild guess, okay? <laughs> Actually, I'm going to guess that you have them inspected annually. So why annually instead of three or five? Because the insurance company won't insure your tower unless you have them inspected. John likes that. I liked it. I'm happy to do it, okay? Now, part of that inspection is John's coming out and he's climbing the tower, right? And he's looking for, what's he, it's a structural observation. He's not checking bolts, by the way. If you ask him to tighten or loosen bolts that are structural on your tower, Make sure you have a large box of them on site, okay? Because if he either tightens them or loosens them, right, they have to be replaced, okay? We all knew that, right? Okay? Can't be reused, okay? An A325 bolt, which is going to be the structural steel bolts all of us have in our structures, right? They were meant to be tightened, torqued, whether by turn of the nut or if the engineer gave you a specific amount of tension that needed to be placed on it and you put a wrench on it and you did that, right? One time. One time. Other, after that, they make really nice boat anchors and scrap steel and stuff like that, right? If it's loose, then what happens is it rocked around. <coughs> it started cutting the threads. It's like, how, how do we know if a stainless steel bolt I can reuse it. How do we know that? That's not a structural steel bolt. Stainless steel bolts aren't structural. All right? How do we know? If you get it off, you can reuse it. Yeah, if the nut will turn on and will the nut will turn off, you can reuse it, right? If you over tighten a stainless steel bolt, any of any y'all ever done that? <laughs> How'd that work for you? You know, you the hacksaw, big wrench, I, you know, I, I'm breaking the bolt or I'm sawing it in two. I, it will not come off. And the reason for that is that I stretch the threads, right? That's what happened. The nut's fine. <laughs> it's the threads that I stretch. Well, those structural steel bolts do exactly the same thing, right? So if I leave it loose, it's ripping on it because it leaned way over here and it's trying to pry it apart, 
right? If I over tightened it, I stretched them. Right? You follow? So the rules are the same, but it's easy for us to evaluate it based on a stainless steel bolt because we've all had to break them a lot. <laughs> okay? So detailed inspections. I, I want to go over that one just a little bit because it might come up for you. Detailed inspections come up when I want to special use a structure for something. Like I'm going to put up a panel FM antenna at a certain center of elevation. Believe me, he wants to know everything there is to know about what's in the faces of the structure. Everything. Because the panel FM, he's got, there's crap. A have any of you all ever looked at the drawings of Larry Shively antenna on the back of his panels? Ooh, you should have seen that when it came in the trucks. I'm talking, it wasn't a truck, all right? No, it wasn't two trucks. It was several trucks, all right? It was like a giant erector set. We built all of the sections on the ground with the panels on two faces installed and then we put them up and stacked them on top of each other and put the third face on because there was a pole in the way for that okay worked really good too still running right life's good periodic inspections those are the ones we talked about annually more than likely your insurance company is going to make the requirements there Let's talk about insurance just a little bit. I'm not an insurance salesman. I don't sell insurance. I know way more than I want to know about insurance. But you keep asking me when I was doing towers, and you probably keep asking John, for these huge liability insurance policies, right? You got a question over there. Yes. When you get inspections done, You can locate a couple of ins blank inspection forms. Okay. If you look in the uh, engineering handbook, the big book, right? Yep. That NABS, it has some suggestions for uh, inspections as well. But you want a written copy of the inspection. If you have a recurrent issue on a structure, right? Or let me see, uh, we have ANC, because inspection, some, some of the inspection part could be you doing it, right. right? So when you go to the site, let's say you visit once a week. Well, in your log, once a month maybe, once a week when you go to the site, you're going to walk around the structure. Is there anything falling on the ground? That's, that's good for, good reason for me to look more, right? right. right? Monthly, let's say, to guide structure. You know, put your hiking shoes on when you go, all right? Because you're going to walk all the guy paths. Right. I'm not drive to the anchors. Walk the guy paths, okay? Because crud comes off and it's laying in the path, and I want to know about that, including animals, all right? And the anchors, just as was mentioned earlier here now, um, when I go to the anchors, I want to see if I have any surface cracking. Do I, if it's uh, you didn't really discuss it, but with anchor rods that are uh, embedded uh, that are that are above ground, that's really nice for me. But the guy who comes to you and he says, "What I want you to do is I want you to dig up the anchor all the way to the block so that I can inspect the rod." He didn't like that. I don't like that either. I think that's a really bad way, right? You do understand that all that dirt is part of the anchor, right? We do understand that, right? All right? Not, not good, okay? Not really not good, okay? Yeah, but you want to go out there. You want to inspect to make sure that the grounding is in place. There's these little clip. If it's a smaller structure, that more than likely your tower is going to have preforms on it, right? A little wrap that goes around the wire, looped at the end, right? Or the thimble's in place. That preform, I mean, that's a really nifty thing, but you do know that I can just unscrew them with a screwdriver, right? And I can put them on, take them off, and do all that kind of good stuff, right? And that it has a little metal clip at the very top. It's 
it, you know, it's, depending on the size of the wire, it's maybe that long. It's got a slot kind of diagonally in one side. They call them ice clips. It's a good name because they're placed on the top of the preform, and you drive them on with a hammer. And if they're not there, when the ice comes sliding down the wire, it takes the preform off. And if it takes it all the way off, the tower falls. Okay? So the likelihood is when ice slides down that wire, you don't want to be there for one thing. Okay? But it isn't going to take it off in one trip. It's going to come down. It's not going to take it all the way off. So if you go and visit it, right, you're going to see it before it's a problem. And you have an opportunity to fix it. Okay? That's a good question. Any others? I haven't, I didn't, I haven't given you the opportunity. I've just been running my mouth. Okay. In insurance. Liability insurance. What is liability insurance for? Tell me what your automotive liability insurance is for. Wait, say again? Pay for your mistakes and omissions. Anybody else? So if the two of us are in a contract, right? The contract rules. He asked me to do something. I agreed to do it for a certain amount of money. He made some requirements of me. I met those requirements. He lets me come and do work. It's good, right? Liability insurance didn't have anything to do with any of that. Nothing. Okay? Liability insurance on your automobile is you're involved in an accident, right? Somebody gets hurt, right? It isn't going to help you. It's not going to help you. It's not going to help the guy that you, that caused the accident on the other side, right? In our case, it's, uh, I screwed up, I did something wrong, and the tower fell. Or, I screwed up and I did something wrong, and I dropped something off the tower, and it hit something on the ground. Could be a person, right? Could be an automobile whatever was on the ground that it hit, right? That's liability insurance, okay? The tower fell down, it crushed a bunch of cars. It's gonna pay for the cars. My question is, who's paying for the tower? Liability insurance doesn't pay for the tower, okay? Liability insurance is for all those other people who happen to be nearby, close up, whatever, not my employees. My employees don't have a problem because, John, what's going to help my employees? Oh, Workman's comp. Workman's comp. Workman's comp's going to pay for my employees, right? Now, his employees who got hurt because you did something, you, the owner of the tower, you, the broadcaster, you did something, hurt his employee, he's going to sue you or sue AT&T or... He's going to sue somebody, right? But he can't sue John because he cannot take workman's comp and say, Corey can't take workman's comp and sue John. He can sue John and not take workman's comp, but it, he can't have both, okay? He can have one or the other, okay? And the problem that we all in the room have is that we don't want Corey to sue us, okay? He's going to be okay. John's going to cover him with the workman's comp, all right? Now, so you hire an independent contractor. This independent contractor is a sing single individual. He comes to your site. He does some kind of work, any kind of work, elevated work, transmitter work, air conditioner work. I don't care. Any kind of work. He's an independent contractor. Right? Did you know that independent contractors do not have to carry workman's comp? They can opt out because they're the owner of the company. But if he gets hurt, he can file workman's comp. On you. He was working for you, wasn't he? He was. You can file workman's comp on you. So how do you mitigate that? 
you ask him for a copy of his workman's compensation insurance. If you make that a part of your requirement, right? Workman's compensation insurance, things you should know. John sends you a certificate of insurance. It says that he worked for Jeff, got Jeff's company name in it and everything. He sends that copy of insurance to you, right? Is that good? I got, I got some nodding heads here. That's the, right, that's the right answer, okay? That means he had insurance for Jeff, right? It doesn't mean he has insurance for you. Your name, your company name, has to be in the certificate of insurance. I own Southern Broadcast Services for 40 years. I sent out thousands of copies of my workman's compensation insurance every year. Most of you in this room didn't even have to ask me for a copy of it. I re-up my policy. The insurance company says, well, where do you want me to send them? And I say, send them to everyone on my list from last year. And that's the reason you get them, right? It gives you the beginning date, gives you the ending date, you know. When you call me, it's an emergency or something, you didn't, you, didn't have to, you didn't have to fight any of that. You already had that on file. I work for Crown Castle and American Tower, SBI. I work for all of the vertical realtors, right? They ask for a recertification copy every six months, in case you don't know. Okay? Because there could be a period of lapse. They don't want that to happen. Insurance is good for a year. CYA, buddy. Good news. Okay? Yep. Occasionally they uh, require uh, notice of association. Yep. Okay, so do we know what that means? That's what I wanted to ask you. Okay. So uh, I was involved in an, an uh, event. I'm going to tell you a story. Everybody loves it when I tell stories, so I'll tell a story. It's just right up the road here. There's a tower. Uh, monopole, it's off to the side of Interstate 65, <coughs> sits right next to actually uh, what used to be the 80, 87th Maneuver Area Command, which is where I served my reserve duty. So it's a monopole, it's owned by Crown Castle, it has multiple tenants on it. Uh, I did work on that facility adding a carrier, and I, it's the lowest carrier on the, on the pole currently. And there was uh, another carrier that was going to go on the next space up, but he didn't have all of his act together. And so Crown, who wants, they're all about tenants, right? They make money if you're on their site. So Crown said, okay, well, we're going to let the client I was working for put theirs in first, and then the other one would come in and put his above that second. I'm good. I go, I fix, I install, I complete. I close out, I get paid, I'm good. In fact, I'm gone for a while, months. Another contractor comes in, and, and kind of a startup company, a, a new outfit, okay? Uh, they send a crew out, they're going to have to install a mount above the one I install. Um, I'm kind of funny about my install, so, uh, all the lines have to lay out really pretty and they got to look really, you know, I'm, I'm just funny that way. And so I uh, use supports on the antenna mount that went all the way out to the antennas that made all the line, you know, all of us engineers that like really neat work, you, you know what I'm saying there? It, it looks really good. So this other crew comes in and they, they managed to get uh, a portion of the collar up and uh, they were putting on the arms and uh, they had uh, determined that they were running transmission line inside the pole. And the location of their mount was above the entry port. And so he couldn't reach it down to get it. And the only thing that he could, uh, he decided the installer decided. By the way, it was the most skilled individual on site that day, he says, okay? He had a guy who actually saved his life, black tape, um, who had been on the job one day, one day, okay? Had not received any kind of formal training of any kind, none. Climb that tower. Okay, all right, 
little scary to me. And so this experienced gentleman, he decided that the way that he would position himself so that he could ensure that the transmission line came out safely was that he took a three-foot lanyard, you know, just little hook, little hook, right? By the way, you remember those OSHA guidances that I put up there, 1910, 1926? Within those guidances, the Department of Labor says you cannot hook a little hook to a little hook. You can't do that, all right? Wrong, bad. So he, he went, went to his company the morning before his accident and got from the safety facility that they had there a three-foot lanyard. And he took the three-foot lanyard out, he put it across the mount, hooked the two hooks together, slid them up a little bit, right? And then he took the hook from his fall arrest lanyard and the hook from his positioning lanyard and hooked them both into that loop that he'd made with that lanyard, right? We good so far? And he lowered himself down, and he's sitting there at that opening. He's really happy with himself. But uh, any of y'all sat in a belt for any period of time? Kind of makes your cheeks get a little snug. Right, Corey? Yeah. And it doesn't matter what kind of belt you're in. Every once in a while, you're going to go, mm, you know, and you're going to kind of, you know, get right? Isn't that what that looks like? It's pretty much like it is, okay? And so that went on a couple of times. He wasn't being very observant, though. Those two hooks hooked together, they're pretty heavy. And so over a couple of, you know, they slid down till they were right underneath the two hooks from his positioning lanyard. Good? And when he did, he opened up the hooks. The hooks came apart, damaged the latches, and he fell. And the only thing that stopped him from dying was that antenna mount that I installed below him. <laughs> exactly right. And the only bad thing about that was, you know, all that nice structure that I'd put in there to hold up those transmission lines and make them, it went right through his thigh. <laughs> kind of like a meat hook, okay? But he didn't fall. And so he decided he would sue somebody. Subligation. I had to protect Crown Castle. I wasn't on site. My work was complete. I'm done. I'm good. I'm gone. My work has been inspected. Right? But I have to protect Crown Castle. Subligation. Good answer? I'm betting after that story, see, you'll remember that. You'll know exactly what subligation is. It means that I have to protect the owner. Okay? Not a good thing. Uh -huh. Is there any situation where the tenants of uh, on a, a tower, let's say AT's tenants, can be held liable for any particular issue? I've heard this discussed with lighting problems. Uh, people have uh, heard two stories. One is that uh, everybody on that tower is liable for the failure of those lights to be on. So lighting, <laughs> yeah, we, we, have, we have lots of people that know the answer to this, okay? The way you get a citation is because you have a license, okay? It's because you hold a license from the Federal Communications Commission. And the Federal Communications Commission is the enforcement body of the FAA. So the FAA says, if you're on the tower and you're a licensed individual, right, that the tower has to be lit if it's 200 feet or higher, right? Or if it's in a glide slope, it might be less than 200 feet, right? If the lights aren't on, everybody gets a ticket, all right, because everybody has a license. So even though it may not be your responsibility to make the lights turn on, it is your responsibility to notify the FA that the lights aren't on or to notify the owner of the structure the lights are not functioning properly so that he can file the notice. So that relates to the license and the privilege of having a license as well as the responsibility, even if you're just a tenant. 
even if you're just a tenant. Got it? Yes? If you notify the tower owner. Yes? Lights are out. Yes? You filed the note. You filed the note? Yes. Okay. You give them the ASR in, of course. That mm -hmm. goes back to the tower owner. If the tower owner drags their feet for however long, do you still have any liability? Yeah, you'll still get cited because you didn't see to it that the lights were repaired. Oh, you can argue that all the time, but I'm just telling you, the FCC is going to cite you, and you're not going to get out of it, okay? Because the rule is the rule is the rule. And, and the fact that you're not paying to get it fixed does, doesn't matter. Good questions. Those are good. <laughs> I wouldn't have thought to bring that up, but... Wait, wait. I'm trying to wrap my head around why you need $6 million of liability. Well, me too, but you're the one that was asking for that, not me now. No, no, no. Well, the towers that I rent, they want the $6 million. I mean, you could replace a lot of cars for $6 million. Yeah, but it's not just the cars, okay? So you drop something, and it falls through a microwave dish that belongs to someone else below you. It's going to fix that, okay? Or... Uh, I'm there and I damage a piece of transmission line or another tenant's antenna or whatever. All of those items are no different than the car at the, on the ground, okay? That was just my example. But to understand you correctly, let's say I've got John working on my tower and his crew screws up and snags the guy, guy line and the tower comes down. Yep. And, and by the grace of God, nobody's hurt, but the tower's laying on the ground. I'm out of business. Yep. So his liability insurance does not have to pay for my tower replacement. Nope. Pays for the cars, the cows you kill, <laughs> new truck, whatever, right. Who pays for the tower? <coughs> you have insurance for that. You, I can't protect your property. Okay? I, I can't my, protect your property. My insurance is just going to turn around and sue him. <laughs> Pro probably. Probably. Okay? But the insurance that's going to actually do the repair work or pay for it, right, is going to be your insurance company. You, none of you can buy insurance on my home, okay? Can't do that. You can't buy insurance on me, okay? I can buy insurance for me, but you can't buy insurance for me. I can sell you an insurance policy, meaning I can, you can give me money and I can give you a policy I bought and give it to you, right? I can do that. But you can't say I want to buy Jeff, an insurance policy. I can't do that. Okay? So the tower owner, he, he's buying the tower always, no matter what, because he owns the tower. But you're right, then everybody's going to start suing everybody. But that's like so long away that you won't be around. It just takes too long. Years. Okay? Ooh, good questions. I'm, I'm liking it. All right. So in the periodic inspection, right, you were asking items. This is the list of things that I would suggest that periodically you check. Some of them seem really simple, right? Now, I recommend that you, if it's a guide structure, that you walk out and you look at the guy wire so you will be comfortable with the way they look. Different manufacturers use uh, the size of the wire, its heft, its weight. They're not using, most manufacturers, unless it's an engineering event that occurs after, you know, down the road a ways, they use 10% of the break of the wire. So if I didn't know, didn't have any information, and the wires were of reasonable size, and you asked me to do uh, a tension check on the tower, I would use 10% of the break of the wire. And that's a listed item, and so I can just look that up, and that would be the tension that I would put the wires at, okay? Now, if the wire gets to be really big, so you go to this 2,000-foot tower, it's got a, a guy wire that's bigger around than my arm, right? The likelihood is it's not at 10% of break. And so let's 
let's discuss why it's not at 10% of break. If you go to that really big tower and you're standing out at the guy wire and you look up, you're standing at the anchor and you're looking at the tower, right? This sucker looks like a ski ramp. And when it gets, it's getting closer to the tower, it just starts climbing really quick, okay? What they're doing is they're using the weight of the wire to dampen the movement of the structure. Okay, does that make sense? Because otherwise, it looks like this. Whereas if I use the weight of the wire, it looks like this, right? It's a really nifty engineering trick. It works really, really good, all right? So use really, really big wires, not because it's, they're afraid it's gonna fall down, but they need the weight of the wire to act as a damper, all right? If it's a really, really big tower, there are two other kinds of dampers that are on the structures that you want to evaluate. One of them will be one you have to take binoculars probably and look at. Uh, if you ride by any high voltage power line, big wires up there, right? They have these little dumbbell looking doohickeys. There's just a lead weight on both sides of a piece of wire that reaches up and grabs a hold of the wire. And what it is, it's exactly the same thing as if I just took my hand and put it on a violin string. That high frequency oscillation, it just eats it up, right? It won't let it do that. And that's exactly what it does on a structure. Anytime I put it on a guy wire structure, the wind blowing through the structure is like me pushing a bow across a string. All those little bitty elements in the tower, they vibrate a lot. I mean, you know, if you've ever been out to your tower site and it's a nice windy day, I mean, it sounds like somebody's singing a song out there because it's so loud, okay? So the high frequency little dumbbell weight gets that one, all right? If it's on a really big structure now, the wire has this other kind of oscillation that goes on, all right? And it's like a swing set, okay? And believe it or not, that's a low, a little bit of wind really low amount, very low speed. It pushes the wire a little bit and then it eases off and it starts swinging it, right? Now, the failures that occurred when we first started building really large towers was it would swing it back and forth enough so that all of a sudden it'd start doing this, okay? And once it got started, it just didn't want to stop, all right? Do you have any wire coat hangers at the house? Okay? And have you ever taken, you know, you needed a piece of wire, right? Maybe for welding. I don't know. I've used them for like everything, all right? Breaking into your car. Yeah, break, I've done that too, you know. But it was my car. It wasn't somebody else's car, right? All right? But if you take that piece of wire and you just bend it back and forth like this, it doesn't take very long before the wire breaks, right? That is bending the wire back and forth. Now, the wire is this big around. It won't matter it will just break it in two. The whole cotton picking thing, all right? So they put down at the bottom, it's always at the anchors, one of two kinds, depending on the manufacturer, stainless uses one, Klein uses another. One is a sand damper, so it's huge, it falls about this big around. It's got a little track that goes around it, right? And I know it looks just like it's just a ball, but if you ever grab a hold of that wire and let it go, it's carrying you over there because it's real heavy. Right? And it is doing the very same thing. The only difference is it's really, really heavy. And it's put under some tension, meaning the weight of the ball. Or the other form is I take a wire cable, I put it to a fixed location through a pulley, and then back to another one, and it acts like the bumper on your car. All right? So it's a really strong spring. And what happens is, when the wire wants to string, it says, oh, no, 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 I don't want you to do that. And, the, and those are the two kinds of dampers on tall towers. So if you have a big tower, those are things you want to, I want to look at the ones up there, and I want to look at the ones on the ground, too. So the, the wire one is actually a, a damper, because I've seen the wires come out of the bottom of the guy before, and they kind of circle around, and you're looking at it going No, nope, that's grounding. Okay. So uh, if I go to the anchor, Grounding is, starts at the top and it just chains all the wires together, got a little loop in each one, and it goes to a grounding rod of some kind in the ground right there, right? And the reason that we would like to do that, right, is we'd like to send it to ground before it gets to all the good stuff out here at the end, 
like the anchor and the turnbuckles and all that good stuff, we'd really like to keep. So it wants to go to ground, and if we give it an opportunity to do that, in general, uh, consensus is that the ground wires are attached before the preforms begin. So you want all of that stuff to be before the preform, and you want it to be before the preform because the ice clips that are on the preforms, right, they're to take the ice off. What do you think that copper ground wire and the little Crosby clip or whatever you used to attach to, it's going to shell off the ice too, right? Okay. And that's just another chance. It's a little added protection for us. But we don't want it to get to any of that, so we put it before it. Okay? Yes. How much rust? I think I know the answer. How much rust is too much rust on a guy? Two kinds of rust. Okay. Surface rust and loss of material. So if I have loss of material, the wires are no longer round, the strands of the wire are no longer round, right? Then they need to be replaced. If it's surface rust, don't you've seen the metal buildings, they actually use tendon. It's a all right, and what they're doing is that material surface rust. But this is true of all rust, all right? If I coated the whole surface with, with rust, then air could never get to the metal again. And if air could never get to the metal again, couldn't rust. Okay? So, so surface rust often occurs and then we go out there and we're cleaning it off or something, but we didn't treat the metal. All that we're doing is losing material. Whereas if we left the surface rust intact, unless we're going to rem So you ask me to come to your site, and I come to the site and I say there's rust here, right? And the owner of the tower asked me to remove all of that rust, then I'm going to have to treat it with something. A zinc-rich paint, an epoxy resin paint, I'm going to treat it with something so that it can't ever rust again. Otherwise, I will continue to lose material, and that loss of material would require the wires to be replaced. Do I think that's likely to happen in any of our lifetimes? No. It's a really long process. Um, southern coastal exposure, coastal exposure in general with high salt content, that's the only time we ever see that. You would be much more likely to have a, a failure of an anchor rod in, uh, interestingly enough, it's, it occurs more in the Midwest than it would here. Uh, here, it's in the water, and it's in the water all the time, and if it's in the water all the time, there's no oxygen, it can't rust. Just, it got nasty on the outside, but it can't do anymore, right? But if I'm in Arizona and someplace like that where there are lots of salts in the soil, and it... <laughs> <laughs> it's an exact description, right? And, and so what occurs is it rains, and the salt acts, and it dries out, and it'll just it'll eat the rod up. So if you're, if you're building a structure in those environments, my suggestion always is to embed them totally. Okay? That way I can inspect them. Yes, Jeff? Okay, so let's talk about that then, all right? Well, so there, there are a couple of ways to grease wires. The, the objective in greasing a wire is to ensure that oxygen can't reach the wire, all right? Um, some of what causes wires to rust is the wire itself is a machine, okay? It's, it's always tightening up and loosening up. It's, it acts as a machine all the time. And all the little strands all the way through, in case you don't know, uh, you, you hear the term EHS and you hear the term bridge strand, okay? The difference is EHS is all the wire, all the strands inside the cable are wrapped in one direction, most often right hand, okay? Right hand lay. Right hand lay is easy. You go and you take your hand and you place it on the guy wire with your hands wrapped around. If the strands are following your fingers, right, that's right hand lay. If you lay your left hand on there and it, 
and the strands are all following your fingers on your left hand, it's left hand lay. Okay? Simple. That made it easy, right? So EH and S, extra heavy strength, EHS, they're all laying in one direction. But if you go to a large structure, okay, the wire is this big. If they laid them all the same way, can, let me tell you what would happen if you tried to lay that on the ground, right? It'd just coil up in a bundle so big, you'd, it'd, be, yeah, it'd be out of control. Couldn't do it, right? So to accommodate that, what we do is we wrap the, the very first layer, solid, it's probably a solid wire, and then we right hand lay, then we lay a left hand on top of that and a right hand on top of that, and on and on and on until it gets to be the size we want it, right? And because they're laid in opposite directions, right? When you lay it out on the ground, it doesn't move at all. It just stays there just like it is, right? Not twisted up. Got it? <laughs> well, but uh, whether it's EHS or bridge strand, the diameter of the cable is going to determine the strength of the cable. So, like I told you, the breaking strength of the cable. Bridge strand is, in general, higher strength cable than EHS, EHS cable, right? It's, it has a greater capacity. But it is because you've made a more efficient machine, okay? Well, on this greasing, is this something that it just paint on, or is it oh. put in the All right, so the, the uh, used to now, we'd put a uh, basket on it, and we'd ride it on the wire, and we'd take a big five-gallon bucket of grease and a hand, and we'd grease it. All right? And that all works really good. Remember I told you how many layers of cable there are? How much grease do you think I got on the bottom layer? None. Zero. I got nothing there, right? So if the objective here was to keep air from getting to those layers, and remembering now, since the machine is moving all of the time, it's taking away the galvanizing all the time, isn't it? It's cutting through all of that, right? So having said that, the machine itself is going to remove the galvanizing over a period of time. Uh, big wire remo can remove it faster. And do I think that uh, greasing is a good way? By hand, absolutely, positively not, okay? And that's a new mechanism. And the new mechanism involves a canister under very high pressure. So the skid has a compressor, a can of grease, and a cartridge. And the cartridge puts this extreme pressure on the wire, so it'll force the grease inside of it. Every single wire has a different size. Every single size have a, has a different canister. The canister is about two or three feet long. And it's towed down the wire. All right? So we're going to rig it, and we're going to part the line so that we can pull it from the ground, right? And pull it down and then we're going to move it to another wire, maybe change the canister, then we're going to tow it back up to the top, you know, we're going to grease them going up and down, right? Oh, is that something that is normal to... I mean, how do you know it's not BS that he's just looking No, that's a given legitimate technique of, of greasing wires. The question I have is whether or not you find that it's necessary. Personally, I would tell you having, you know, done that, right? Uh, at the request of clients, I would say not necessary. I wouldn't recommend it to one of my clients. I never recommended it to you or any of you. And, and the reason for not recommending it is that if I get that much wear on the wire, more than likely what I'm doing is I'm replacing the structure. Okay? Because it's going to last that long, 40 years. You know, by that time, you know, we've done all the structural reinforcements we can on the thing. And by the way, when we do structural reinforcements on towers, oftentimes we change sizes of wires. We change sizes of wires because that weight that we were using, right? When I put something on the structure, I increase the wind loading at that elevation, right? And when I do that, I've messed up all of this counterbalance weighting that I'm doing. So sometimes, remember now, I'm only using 10% of the break. So the first thing that I do when I put something on it, it increases the wind load, is most often I increase the tension. I just bump the tension up a little bit, right? It acts as a little stronger damper because the added wind load is trying to push it harder. That makes good sense, right? But eventually, I may reach a point where I need to change the wire. And so 
with all of that going on, it would have to be an extraordinarily odd environment. Uh, it's, there are some uh, structures like uh, uh, the Blunox Tower are just outside of Nashville and they do grease those wires. Uh, they are segmented wires, so it's a pain in the butt. <laughs> As Watt would tell you, it's a pain in the butt. But they're doing it for a totally different reason. Those are socketed in uh, ins huge insulators because they're you know, just the eight wires that hold it all up. So they got a good reason for doing it. Yes? So say you are a tower owner mm -hmm. and you have a lot of tenants, or you're a tenant on a tower somebody else owns. Uh, do you need to provide a copy of your periodic inspection to your tenants? If you're a tenant, do you, should, you, should you ask or should you be provided the results of one by the owner? Or if you haven't seen any inspections done as a tenant for a while or know of any inspections done, should you either try to prod them to get any inspections done or just get one yourself? So I, my recommendation would be, right? If you're the owner of the structure, you have a requirement every three and five, right? right? Depending on the structure. Your insurance company, for you to continue to have insurance, is going to make a requirement greater than that on you. You're going to do them because if you don't have insurance, it's a bad day, right? So you're not going to do that. You as a tenant, you as a tenant can ask for a copy, and I'm pretty certain that as a tenant, they will pr provide you with that. At a time in which you change an antenna or uh, require something else to be placed on it, you're the one more than likely paying for the structural evaluation, and that structural evaluation is going to have an inspection that's involved with it. I'd, I'd definitely get a copy of that because you paid for it. Right. Okay? Is that helpful? Yes. So but there's no reason why you can't ask for one anytime okay. from them. And then is it courtesy uh, if you get an analysis to send it to your tenants without no. being asked? Or just no. I, I, I don't see that occur. Okay. Um, things that do occur. Um, John needs to create a rigging plan. He may need the structural of, that's part of that to create a class four rigging plan. You are a tenant and you need a copy of the most recent structural evaluation to get it to John so John can create the rigging plan. Does that make sense? So that's another reason for you asking for it. Okay. We all know what appurtenances are now, right? Yeah, yeah. You'd be surprised. I get to talk about talk to a lot of people, and appurtenances is, is if you read in 222 and you read in 322, 322 in specific on rigging plans, that's going to be the word. I mean, they're going to use it like a dozen different times in the standard, telling you what they're talking about an appurtenance. Okay. So let's talk about each one of these in particular. I'm going to dim the lights just a little bit so you can look at them really close. Is that better for you? Okay. What happened to this monopole? Well, it's laying on the ground, that's for sure. Do you, do you know what caused that failure? And I'm going to tell you the inspection you should be doing, okay? I'm saying rust. You are, that's true. Just stress or stress. Stress or corrosion. So, have we ever played with a plastic straw? Oh, come on. We've all played with a plastic straw, right? So, when I flex the straw, right, it goes from round to ellipse and back and forth, and back and forth, and back. Is that kind of like that coat hanger wire we were bending? Okay. Now, interestingly enough, the reason that it happens on monopoles at that location is that the pole wasn't heat treated properly when they welded the flange on. And so what it did is it tempered the steel at that elevation on the pole, right? It became like a chisel, hard, really hard, right?
because of the way we want to weld things on towers, if you've ever looked at the pictures of your really big towers that get built, they flame heat the steel, right? And they bring the temperature of this really huge piece of steel up to a temperature that's closer to what this little piece of steel is that I want to weld to it. And then they weld it, and then they cool it off really slowly, right? If they didn't, you and I could just go along and go, bing, and it'd pop that weld right off because it'd be really, really hard, right? Like your knife blade, and it would break it, right? <laughs> That's what happened here. It wiggled back and forth all day long, every day. By the way, it wiggles back and forth, even if the wind didn't blow in, because the earth is turning, right? So it's moving back and forth all day long. And oh, by the way, it, the sun shines on one side, and then it goes around and shines on the other side, and when it does that, it spans the steel on the side it's shining on, right? Bends the pole, and then when it gets over here, it bends it the other way, right? Every day, all day long. So, when you go to inspect this, right? That place where you see it's rusted, that's where it was cracked. And so the crack just, it started as a little crack. And then the crack got a little, because that was weak now, it got a little bigger and it got a little bigger and it got a little bigger and got a little bigger. So that if we look there, we see that on this side over here, no rust, right? And, and, but it, all the way over here, rust all the way around. So finally it got to the point where, you know, a little breeze came along and on the side that was cracked it said, oh, and it just broke the rest of it off, right? If you'd gone out there and you'd looked at it by walking all the way around it, right, you would have seen the crack. Because, I mean, it gets to be rusty on the outside where the crack is, right? And if you'd seen that, then you could have taken corrective action to ensure it didn't fail. Good? Could that occur at your anchor plates, your anchor rods, your hardware, your tower base, your base insulator? Isn't that what you're trying to look for? I hope it is. I hope that's what you're looking for, okay? So that's always a good one. By the way, if your guide tower has an anchor that's this deep, right? You know what the failure is going to be here? This turnbuckle is going to fail. Okay? It's in the ground. It wasn't ever meant to be in the ground. Ever. Right? It wasn't built to be in the ground. Turnbuckle, the threaded portion of it, it started out being this big and then I cut threads in it. And when I cut threads in it, it made it get smaller, didn't it? And because I cut all those threads in it, that's the place that's going to rust first, too. Okay? No matter how good a job they did at galvanizing it or whatever, that's still going to be the place that fails first. By the way, I don't believe that you can inspect that cotter key that's in the pin that's supposed to be holding that turnbuckle in place. I, you know, just saying, just saying. I'm thinking you probably can't do that, right? Uh, question related to the turnbuckles. Mm -hmm. Is there a preferred method for looping the safety wire through there? So there, uh, yes. Uh, so let's talk about what safety wires do. That's a really good question. What is a safety wire for? It, and that's the only purpose it serves. All right, the only purpose it serves is to keep the turnbuckle from spinning. Because if it's spun enough, it'd just come apart and the tower would fall again. That's always the same result, you know, it always falls. So the preference, the preference. In this, in this specific scenario, the forming a loop is all that's required as long as it goes through the center of the turnbuckle, I prefer figure eights. I prefer figure eights. Okay? But the only requirement is that I pat. The cable is just easy. If I took a metal rod and I stuck the metal rod through all of the, the spaces in the middle of the turnbuckles, 
it would serve the same purpose, wouldn't it? Because the whole objective of the safety is to keep the turnbuckles from turning. So a loop is okay. I prefer a figure eight. My, the reason I prefer a figure eight is that I have seen failures. And believe it or not, that little bitty piece of 3 eighths wire saved the sucker from falling. So twice as much wire, twice as much security for me. Right? That, that's, the, that's my reasoning for liking it better. Okay? You like my pickers are so far? That's a self-supporter. It's actually in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Right? It means you've got to inspect the whole anchor. Right? About self-supporters, where's most rust occur in self-supporters? So there are two ways they're done. Uh, old school is you grout the base, right? You put cement underneath it. And if you walk up there and there's not a hole or a piece of pipe or something, right, you have big trouble, okay? Because that means that it's a hollow, more than likely a hollow pipe tower, and that there will be a column of water as high as there are pipes. And it can't get out at the bottom. So it's just working on rusting it all out from the inside from the day they put it up, which won't be very good for you. And I've certainly had the opportunity to be at ones that holes in the legs were big enough for me to put my closed fist through the hole in the side of the leg. Okay. So, so you have a you have a new guide tower. And. Uh, New guide towers, a, a number of manufacturers, they, it's a combination of both solid rods and tubes. Okay? Uh, tube is extremely strong, but it does ellipse when it's bent. So rods have advantages, but they're heavy. So uh, some manufacturers, uh, they'll stack several solid rod sections uh, low on the tower, and then they all of a sudden, the leg will get bigger. That's a cue to you that it got to be a tube because it took a bigger tube to accommodate the same strength as a solid rod. Okay? And by the way, we'd like it lighter at the top and heavier at the bottom. Uh, right? Uh, pretty much for all of us, right? So if, if that's the case, everywhere there's a tubular leg, it has to have a drain. <coughs> there will be condensation. Cap it off on the top and the bottom, but the air that was left inside, it's going to rain in there. And when it rains in there, it's going to rust it. It'll always be down at the bottom. And those holes, when you have people work on your structures and they're climbing the towers, right? You know that you have tubes in the tower. Then what you want to do is make sure that they clean out the holes to make sure the water has an escape route. Okay? Oh, I see. He's wrapping up. Golly, you have you got a whole lot of other stuff I hadn't talked about yet. Uh, plumness of towers, right? Does plumness, it, the tower could be straight and not be plumb, okay? The tower could be straight and not be plumb. Plumb means perpendicular to the face of the earth, okay? You want your tower to be plumb. You'd like it to be straight, too. Where can you correct straightness on a, a guide tower? At the guide levels. It's the only place you can make any change, okay? So if you look up the tower and the tower is somehow not aligned and it's in between guide levels, that's a problem, all right? Because I can't fix that. Okay. You should receive a tension report, and that tension report's going to have all the information in it that shows you the size of the wires, the tensions they were, the tensions they were when I got there, the tensions were when I left if you asked me to plumb a tower. So it doesn't matter if John or whoever is doing it, that should be information you should expect from them because you'd like to know what happened. That's just like knowing what your transmitter is doing. You'd like to know. Lighting. Nice, huh? <laughs> nice. I didn't show you anything good, right? <laughs> The beacon, the glass is broken in the bottom. I really like the side lights. Those, those are really good, right? <laughs> oh, my. 
And these are all appurtenances, aren't they? Paint, rust, and torque of bolts, we went over that, so we'll let that go by. Uh, different kinds of appurtenances. That's a panel antenna right there. Yeah, you like that? How about that? So this soft cable, right, it's supported by what? A piece of rope, right. <laughs> I get, I, I'm going to say they didn't use a hoisting grip, though. I'm going to say they didn't use a hoisting grip. And by the way, if the guy even, if he puts a hoisting grip on it and he picks up 500 feet of line, you're already in trouble. All right? How, much, how, when, how often did I tell you that you had to have a hoisting grip? Have a 200 feet, okay? If he doesn't pick that up that way, it's going to, the hoisting grip, it's just going to keep getting tighter and tighter with the weight below it. It will crush it flat. <laughs> it will. All right? The foam one, it won't crush it flat. It'll just eat through the copper. <laughs> it'll, the little stainless steel will just eat it up. We talked about this, didn't we? All right? Yeah? Everybody got all that. Okay, that's a pet peeve for me, all right? We all want a safe work site, right? Right? So OSHA says safety is first. I say bogus, all right? Safety is not first. Think back on your very first employer, the guy you went to work for the very first time, right? What is the first thing he did for you? He trained you to do whatever he wanted you to do, didn't he? You cannot be doing work safely if you have been not been trained to do the work correctly, right? Now, it'll be more efficient and it'll do all of those kind of good things if you train the employees. If you train the employees, they will be able to create a safe workplace. John, when he comes to the site, he has to do a job hazard analysis. The guy that comes to you and says, this is an unsafe tower, is because he doesn't have, the adequ have adequate or appropriate training to do that scope of work, okay? Don't ask him to. Don't ask him to, right? Go hire someone who has the skills, knowledge, and expertise to do it because he's been trained to do it, okay? Because you are the controlling contractor. See, all of us, we're preaching from the same hymnal here. I'm just telling you. I, I, don't, I know that it, you, hopefully you are all have been very fortunate. Some of us not so fortunate. Um, I lost a life of a crew member on my friend's site. And I had to go to uh, his parents and tell him that he passed away and his grandparents, and his fiance. okay? He had the appropriate training, he had the appropriate equipment, and the employee didn't use it. It doesn't make me feel any better at all. Zero better here, zero better, okay? Could I have checked up more? Could I have I verified better? Could I, I, I should have been able to do something to not have that occur. You will fall prey to the very same things, all of you, all right? Every one of you, you're a controlling contractor. I don't want you to ever, ever tell John how to do his job, ever, right? If I'm working with you, I'm gonna ask you what you want me to do. That's what I'm gonna ask. If we're inside the transmitter building, I mean, I get to work with a whole bunch of you inside the transmitter buildings. You ask me for opinions, I give you opinions, we work together, you know, we're all very successful. But John knows how to do, to do something you don't know how to do. You need to allow John to go about doing it. But you, all of you, have to know when you see him doing something inappropriately, let's say like free climb, which was the reason we had a failure, all right? 
He was doing everything correctly. He unhooked himself from a safe climb system to pass another employee because the employee was stopping smoking a cigarette and slipped and fell. And oh, by the way, it was the last climb. His facility was complete. We were downrigged from the site. He was the second most skilled individual on the site. Free climbing, bad idea. Every time, right? And by the way, if you free climb on any vertical realtor site, they will dismiss you from the site. There will not be a question. There is no recourse. Bye. Like that. It has to be the same way for you. So how do you correct John? You're not telling him what to do. You're controlling contractor. Stop. Stop work. All right? Now, if John sent a crew out, I don't want you to... You just ask his crew to stop work. Then you call John. You're, you contracted with John, right? You have a conversation with John. You voice your concerns to John. Right? That's the way to make that happen. It, it fixes all the problems I'm talking. They, they show up smelling like a brewery. They all look hungover. Your job, sh your job should be stop. You can't work today. That's your job. All right? Now, we got one other thing we got to commit to you, then I'm going to give it back to Larry and thank you all very much. You can stop work. That part's fine. Can't tell them what to do, right? And when you walk up on site, they own it. They own it. The contractor is in charge of the site. You want him to be in charge of the site, right? If he has control of the site, he should ask you. He should say, could you read over my JHA and sign the bottom? You signing the bottom acknowledges that you understand what the hazards are that John's creating today. He's creating some overhead hazards, right? Read his JHA. It will tell you his job hazard assessment. It's going to tell you exactly what he's going to be doing because that's how he communicated to his men. You'll know. He said, well, wait just a minute. I'm going to stop this work. We'll let you go in the building here. Carry this radio with you. When you get ready to leave, push the button. Tell me you're ready to go. I'll stop work again when you come out. Fixed. Done. Solve the problem. Easy, right? Then we won't have an incident like the one we had in Talladega where, you know, guy drops an antenna, guy's working in the building, leaving the building, going to lunch, antenna falls, strikes him in the back of the head, kills him. Two different contractors. Simple. Easy. Not a problem, all right? Same thing for all of y'all. Leave them in charge. If you tell them what to do, if you tell them how to do their work, I'd like for you to rig over here, right? All of the insurance they have, you just became the guy in charge. You became the one who is running the show. You don't want to do that. That's the reason you hired them, isn't it? Okay? So you can't tell them what to do. You've got to ask permission to go on site. Work together. Be nice. Okay? Otherwise, bad things happen. All right? And it doesn't have to always be high. My guy fell. He was less than 60 feet from the ground. At the bottom guy level. All right. I thank you all for your time very much.